Hey there everybody and welcome back to the channel for the third and final part of our deep and turn out deep deep dive what by the time of this part 1813 is now Le Troisième Régiment Austrangier formerly the Irish Regiment formerly the Irish Legion now if you've not heard parts one or two I do recommend that you check those out first because we'll be building on the characters that we met there Colonels Lawless and Tennant, Captain Burns, McCarthy and Allen and we'll be following those and others through the battles for the heart of Europe. We joined the regiment in this part in spring 1813, and what started off as a motley crew of dispossessed Irishmen in a regiment that had nearly two officers per private soldier had now become something of a veteran reserve unit in Napoleon's army of new recruits, the so-called Mary Louises. Having seen service in Holland against a British expeditionary force and in the vicious guerrilla actions in Spain these were men amongst boys that made up the army of 1813 and after the disaster in Russia and the loss of many of his experienced soldiers Napoleon had moved all his reserve units to the German front the Irish were currently stationed on the Aller Elbe preventing Russian proing attacks across the river now when we last left Colonel William Lawless's regiment at the end of part two the two battalions had once again been separated. The first battalion, under chef de battalion tenant, were at Uelsen, a town in Lower Saxony, roughly halfway between Hamburg and Magdeburg, digging into an Easter Sunday feast that had been left for them by a rotor of Cossacks that they'd just thrown out of the town. The second were at Sells, commanded by chef de battalion Hugo Ware, and had just beaten up some Cossacks as well. Now, if you've not listened to part two, then I suggest that you uh, you just nip back there, particularly at the end, because Ware is absolutely crazy. He goes across a burning bridge on his horse. The guy's an absolute lad. Now, while the Irish were doing pretty well for themselves, fending off the enemy's probing attacks, the rest of the army were being pushed back by the main forces of the Allies. In May 1813, the Russian-Prussian army launched a full-scale assault near the city of Lutzen, a city that had seen a major battle in 1632, during the Thirty Years' War. This was one of the major set-piece battles of the Napoleonic Wars and was, saw a close victory for Napoleon. But, following the battle, his exhausted army were unable to pursue the enemy to their destruction. Due to their activities elsewhere along the uh, Eller Alba, the Irish were not involved in the fight. But, after taking casualties in his main army at Lutzen, Napoleon ordered his Irish resident to join them as reinforcements. This would be the first time that the Irish would serve under the overall command of Napoleon himself and they were thrilled at the prospect. Their General de Division, General Sebastiani, was sorry to see them go. According to Byrne, quote, nothing could be more flattering for the regiment than the praises the officers received from General Sebastiani when they were presented to him by Colonel Lawless, previous to their departure to the Grand Armée. He said that the good result of the different affairs on the Elbe from the beginning of the campaign was due to their activity and bravery, end quote. Now, just in case you've not heard the previous parts, Captain Byrne is the company commander of the 1st Battalion's Grenadier Company. He wrote a memoir after the war, and we will be drawing from him extensively. He's got a real flair for language. How much of the exact conversations are word for word? Well, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys, but at least you get the gist of of if not the actual conversation, the gist of Captain Byrne himself anyway. Anyway, so having been moved from the army of General Sebastiani, they would now be under General Jacques Puto, a career soldier. Puto was a no-nonsense kind of guy, and had once been suspended for arresting Napoleon's ordnance officer, Casimir Montmartre, who had been returning to base from a secret mission and wouldn't identify himself to Puto's sentries. The Irish were to form part of the 17th Division in the 5th Corps under General Lauriston. And so, once together once again, the two battalions of Irish marched to meet their new commander. Now, again, it's worth pointing out, I say battalions of Irish, and whenever I mention the fact that it's an Irish regiment or anything like that, if you've not heard the previous parts, or you know, if it's been a while, then it's worth remembering that while the officers' mess would often sound like the, uh, the tap room of a Dublin pub, the other ranks, the NCOs, the senior NCOs, were from a whole smattering of different nations. Uh, there, there were, I think there were 32 nations represented, but certainly the largest contingent 
in the regiment were the 99 Hungarians, but there were also 52 Austrians, 57 Frenchmen, 77 Germans, there were two Spanish, five Yankees, five Americans, and there were even two from South America as well. Now, I'd imagine they were from Argentina, and they were part of the uh, the regiment that sailed from there to get thrashed by the French. But even so, you've got guys as far from as far away from Ireland as South America. Now, Napoleon, at this point, like a bear being harried by a pack of smaller hounds, was gearing up for a large-scale swipe of his paw, a confrontation that would force his pursuers back and gain some breathing room for him and his army. By this time, Napoleonic battles had become much more modern affairs. Gone were the battles that began at sunrise with a single cannon shot and ended with a clear victor at sunset. These were often multi-day affairs, and on the 20th of May 1813, the two-day Battle of Bautzen began. Napoleon's plan was, according to David Chandler, quote, the best he could have managed, end quote, and relied on hitting the flanks of his enemies. This, he hoped, would lead them to weakening their centre to reinforce the exposed wings, in which case his reserve, his Imperial Guard, could smash through the centre, cutting the enemy in half and driving those two halves away from each other, which meant they could later be dealt with one at a time. This would be the hammer and the anvil upon which it would crash, the the units that would move behind the enemy to allow the uh, the troops to push through, that would be the 5th Corps, including our Irish regiment. Now, not wanting to, uh, to miss this grand battle, the Irish force marched their new division as quickly as they could. Now, the Battle of Lutzenbautzen is, I mean, it, again, it's another major set-piece battle in the Napoleonic Wars. It's one that's reasonably famous, and it's worth... It's worth you know, a lot more discussion. But the uh, on the 20th of May, the Irish, we're just going to focus on their involvement here, the Irish were marching to their divisional commander who was already engaging the enemy. Captain Byrne Wright, quote, On the 20th of May, they, meaning the 17th Division, slept on the field amongst the dead, where General Lauriston had attacked the Prussians under General York the day before and forced him to retreat, end quote. Starting early on the morning of the 21st, they arrived as five corps was launching a general attack against the Russians of Barclay de Tolly. Seeing the green coats of the Irish regiment certainly seems to have raised General Lauriston's spirits. Byrne recalls, quote, Lauriston welcomed Colonel Lawless in the most friendly manner and was delighted to see the regiment looking so well after so much fatigue, and the fine band of music enchanted him, which, contrary to custom and at their own request, preceded the regiment until the battle began. End quote. The second division were not placed in reserve, but thrust directly into the fighting, and being ordered to attack the village of Wurzen, held by Cossacks. Of course, he was held by Cossacks. That's all the Irish ever seemed to fight at the moment. Byrne continues, quote, The regiment was soon employed to attack the enemy, and after passing in close column over a part of the field of battle, strewed with the dead and wounded under a tremendous fire, Colonel Lawless deployed it and sent the grenadiers in front and the voltigeurs on the flanks to begin the attack, which proved successful, end quote. Their part in this battle was over, and once again the Irish had acquitted themselves well, with the French army being successful, though due to the stiff resistance from the Allies, not least the Russian Guard, it was not the cut-off the Emperor had hoped, meaning that the Allies actually suffered less casualties than the French. But again, looking at the Irish's perspective, they had their mission, and that's what was achieved. After the battle, Marshal Ney, quartered in a chateau located in Verschen, the town taken by the Irish, as a mark of honour, sent for their grenadiers to stand guard. This posting would have been especially welcomed by the elite company, as the evening of the 21st saw a violent downpour. Later that evening, the Marshal's headquarters became an even better place to be, after finding a hidden stash of wine. And soon, all the senior officers of the 17th Division, including those of the Irish, were invited to join him for supper where they lamented their lack of cavalry to turn the enemy's retreat into a rout. That didn't mean it was the end of the fighting, however, and a series of running battles took place over the following week or so. The 22nd began early at 4am for the Irish, with them forming the vanguard of the pursuing force, moving down the road to Goelitz. Byrne recounts that, quote, During the day's manoeuvring and fighting, the Irish regiment was continually employed, end quote. And this is that day-to-day friction this day-to-day fighting skirmishing that you know you, you fire off you kill a guy you get two guys wounded and then you just do it all again the next day this is where 
Uh, Napoleon once famously said, I spend 3,000 lives a month or something. I can't remember the exact number, but this is where those numbers come in. It's not glamorous. It doesn't go on any flags, but this is what the reality of it is. I, I, I think I've, I've gave that a little spiel before, I think. It was on this road that the Russians under Prince Eugen of Württemberg formed up a rear guard, which led to the clash that became known as the Combat of the Reichenbach. Here, the Russians held out for five hours before a threatened outflanking move by Lauristal and his Irish forced them to withdraw to a new position outside Görlitz. But this delay was more than enough for the Allies. The next three days saw them pursuing the, the Allies, but on the 26th, the Irish would once again fight in the main battle, and this time it would be under the eyes of the Emperor himself. As mentioned before, Lauriston's division formed the vanguard of the French army, the point of the sword poking the Allies in the back, and on the evening of the 25th, they camped around the town of Haydau. That's uh, H-A-Y-N-A-U, not Hanau, which is H-A-N-A-U, which is another battle, and we'll talk about that later. So this is the Battle of Haydau, H-A-Y-N-A-U. One of the divisions in Lauristone's corps camped on the far side of the town, which also meant that they were on the other side of the river, with the three divisions making up the rest of the corps, including the Irish regiment, on the near or the west bank. Seeing this isolated gaggle of infantrymen, Gebhard von Blücher, remembering his days as a dashing officer of hussars, ordered 15,000 men, the majority of them in 20 squadrons of Landwehr cavalry, to attack. Soon, the division of General Maison was overrun, but the rest of the corps were quick to arms. This was particularly the case for the Irish, as they had only just arrived at their designated nighttime area. The unit had yet to disperse, and so were quick to form up and begin to move. In support of the beleaguered 1st Division, currently surrounded by Prussian lancers and the ever-present Cossacks. This is one of those classic escalation battles. What starts off as a quick attack of opportunity by an Allied cavalry division soon begins to grow its own gravitational field, sucking nearby units and commanders into it. In order to rescue his first division, General Lauriston sent these other two divisions across the river to help them, requiring the Allies to send in their infantry to counter the French, leading to the French sending artillery to support their infantry against the enemy infantry, leading to Prussia, and so on and so on and so on. This effect was supercharged when it reached Napoleon's ears that Frederick Wilhelm, the King of Prussia himself, was at Hainau. At this news, the Emperor made all haste to the battlefield, arriving as the day reached full light. Galloping onto the scene, he looked for a place he could safely assess the developing battle. And so it was that this band of exiles, misfits that had escaped County Wexford some 15 years ago to bring the spirit of liberté, egalité and fraternity back to Ireland after throwing out the hated English, finally met their emperor. This was the first and only time that Napoleon joined the Irish in battle and Byrne records that he stayed with them for about half an hour directing operations. With cavalry swarming all around the 1st Division though, there wasn't a huge amount the Irish could do, except form up in a hollow square and watch. The 1st Division had formed rally squares, and so were safe-ish for now, but the infantry and artillery were on its way, and something had to be done to extricate them. The divisional commander, General Lauriston, feared that he would be censored by Napoleon, but instead Marshal Ney had already taken the blame, insisting that he personally had seen to the knight's depositions. Napoleon, clearly in a good mood, replied, Well, Marshal, it seems we must teach them another lesson this day, and ordered a general assault, forcing the enemy cavalry to fall back. With the order given, and the Irish literally surrounding the Emperor, they were the first to move off, leading the vanguard, Captain Allen's grenadiers being the first to capture the town of Lignitz, a town that would go on to form the centre of the French defensive line for the next three days. Upon seeing the dashing captain and his men in their green coats, Napoleon asked which unit they were from, and ordered, again as an honour, the Irish to guard his headquarters until the Imperial Guard could relieve them. Byrne recalls another incident with our impudent Sergeant Costello from episode 2. He clearly hasn't changed at all, and the, uh, the incident goes, quote, Marshal Ney watched the Irish in action, and reprimanded Sergeant Costello for not falling back to the rallying point immediately the trumpet sounded. The sergeant explained that a Cossack had fired twice at him, and he had waited to kill the man before withdrawing. Did you? asked the marshal. I hope so, said Costello, for I saw him fall from his horse. Ah, le bonheur, replied the Prince of Moscow, end quote. Napoleon had been impressed with the Irish. Later, General Lauriston would remark to his friend Colonel Lawless that the Emperor himself 
had asked him to pass on his compliments. The general then asked Lawless if the officers back at the depot in Holland were of the same calibre as the men here, and if they were, they were to make all haste to join the regiment. As briefly mentioned before, the lines became static for the next couple of days, as both armies fell back and took something of a breather, the Irish staying at Lignitz on the 27th and 28th of May. While there were no major actions, skirmishes still ran up and down the line, as the Allies fell back to find a defensive line of their own. The Irish were moving via Newmarket on the 30th to Lissa on the 31st, when General Puthal attacked a rearguard of the Allies. Leading the attack was the 2nd Brigade, a brigade that was made up of four battalions of the 148th line under General Pastol, although uh, Byrne calls him Postel, so I don't know. Uh, Yves-Marie Pastol had enlisted into the Revolutionary Army in 1791 as a private soldier and had risen to the rank of captain in less than five years. He would win further promotion, spending the majority of his time as General de Brigade in the Italian Army. At about nine in the evening on the 31st of May 1813, General Pastol launched his men forward. Leading from the front, he was struck by a musket ball, killing him. Seeing the death of their commander, the 148th wavered. It fell to his aide-de-camp, Lieutenant Osmond, still officially part of the Irish regiment, to slide off his horse and lead the regiment in the assault across the river, enemy fire kicking up spumes of water around him. For his bravery, Osmond was mentioned in the bulletin of the day and would be inducted into the Légion d'Honneur. The French had now formed a recently defensive line, but Napoleon made a decision, one which Frederick Maud wrote in 1905, was the largest mistake of Napoleon's career, and that was to sign the Armistice of Pleischwitz, effectively a summer ceasefire. Now, I'm not sure that it was entirely his worst decision. I mean, he did invade Russia, but it was undoubtedly a very, very bad one. While he clearly thought it would give him time to recruit new troops, reinforce and reorganise existing units, and raise another levy en masse, it also allowed the Prussians further time to raise their land via, more than matching the numbers of the levy. If that wasn't bad enough, both Austria and Sweden also took this opportunity to declare war on France as well. In hindsight, it really, really was a terrible, terrible decision. But for the Irish, however, they would of course benefit from the short ceasefire because they didn't have that daily wastage, that daily grinding, what in modern warfare is called friction. They didn't have that to deal with. The armistice was to last from the 4th of June 1813 to the 15th of August, and this warm summer was spent in cantonments in a small village called Holberg, near Breslau, a city east of Berlin on the Oder River, which is now actually in Poland. Knowing they'd be there for a while, the Irish made themselves at home, building wooden huts that were, according to Byrne, the envy of the division. At this point, two Irish officers, Captains McCarthy and McGrath, left the regiment, having been promoted to ADCs on the staff of our old friends General Casterol and General Loriston, respectively. Captain O'Reilly, the man who had received the regiment's eagle from the Emperor's hand in 1804, moved to command the Voltigeur Company of the 1st Battalion. And Captain McGrath, the chap who'd gone to the become the aide-de-camp of General Lauriston, wouldn't be away long because the general soon inspected the Irish regiment, using this opportunity to award six of its members the Légion d'Honneur. These were Colonels Ware and Tennant, Captains Byrne, Parrott and St. Ledger, uh, St. Ledger, St. Saint- Ledger. I'm going to say St. Ledger because uh, I live in Sheffield, which is near Doncaster. Doncaster has the St. Ledger race, which was named after one of his descendants. So I'm just going to go with St. Ledger in this one. And, as was mentioned above, Lieutenant Osmond. Now, while not particularly related to the Irish regiment, I just I just found this information out and I thought it was relatively interesting. We've made a reference to a chap called Wolf Tone, He was the guy who led the 1798 Irish Rebellion. Uh, And his only son in 1813, his only son was William Theobald Wolfe Tone, was now a French citizen. He had been made a sub-lieutenant of the 8th Regiment of Chasseurs, and he was moving to the front during this lull. His nickname, or his, his nom de guerre, I guess you could say, was Le Petit Loup, the Little Wolf. He would go on to fight at Lohenberg, Goldberg, we'll get to that in a bit, Dresden, Mulberg, and Aachen. His final battle would be at Leipzig, where he received a grand total of six lance wounds, 
Following this, it wasn't death, amazingly, but he was promoted to lieutenant and aide-de-camp of General Banieres, and he was decorated with the Légion d'Honneur. After Napoleon's final defeat, he fled to America, joined their army, and ended his career as a captain in the US Army. As, as I say, nothing particularly relevant to the Irish regiment in of itself there, but because we've the, the spectre of Wolf Tone hangs over the unit, and I just I just thought it was interesting. Anyway, back to the third foreign regiment, the Troisième Regiment Estranger. Their time wasn't just spent building wood cabins and polishing their new medals during the ceasefire, however. Byrne records the men were drilled twice a day, practicing their new hollow square formations, because he says, quote, For the want of cavalry, this order of battle became more urgent, end quote. And he was not wrong. There is perhaps an argument for giving the French units of 1813 a bonus for forming squares, actually. Because this seems to have been fairly common across the army. Now, I wonder if that'll be factored in if and when the 1813 book comes out. Or whenever that's going to be, who knows. But, uh, yes, I, 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 it's an interesting thing that if a unit focuses on something, or an army focuses on something, maybe it could get, say, a re-roll to fail tests or something like that. I, I don't really know. Additionally, the men were issued with live cartridges for firing and target practice, something which obviously seems fairly reasonable to do these days, but back in Napoleonic times, marksmanship wasn't actually particularly highly valued, particularly amongst the French, although perhaps experiences against troops who did have respect for good marksmanship, so I'm thinking the 95th Rifles, of course, in Spain, or even fighting uh, against... German Jaegers, or fighting alongside Bavarian Jaegers, for argument's sake, it may have been that the uh, the French Kai Command suddenly realised that maybe God wasn't on the side of the big battalions, but on the side of the best shots. The returns from this period are also quite helpful as well. A return is the, the document that the regimental quartermaster returns to the headquarters, and it's normally got a total of men equipment, everything down to shoes, uh, musket locks, the flints to go in them. It's, it's everything that a regiment will need and require. And because, you're obviously, when you're at war, you've got other things to worry about. But when you're at peace, you've got time to take stock. You need to re-equip all these things so you take a good inventory. And it means that our numbers of personnel at this period are actually reasonably accurate. You could may, maybe they're out by sort of half a dozen or so, but uh, they're probably uh, probably about right. Now we can see from these that the Irish still are massively over officered. If you look at the unit strengths compared to the rest of the units in their division, there was a little bit of a, of a jiggle around. But the first battalion had. Um, well, we'll get on to the units in the uh, in the brigade. Sorry, not not the division. There was a jig around in the brigade. We'll get on to that in a second. But if you look at the Irish regiment, the first battalion had two hundred and eighteen rank and file, and they were officered by twenty officers, which is basically about uh, one per ten, as opposed to the first battalion of the one hundred and thirty fourth infantry regiment. They had twenty eight officers. And they had 585 men. So they had one officer per 21 men. And the other regiment in the brigade, the 146th, their first battalion was an absolutely monster battalion. They had uh, 43 officers and they commanded 718 men, which is slightly better than the previous unit. They had one officer per 16. Now, I do think that this over-officering, there's a, a new word for you, should have an in-game effect, and we'll get to that closer to the end. I should also point out as well that both of those regiments, the 134th and the 146th, both had four battalions in the field. We're getting to the time now where a French regiment can consist of, well, of almost any number of battalions, but certainly up to six wasn't infrequent. The French, uh, sorry, the Irish, they're still rocking at two battalions, and they're still combined probably about a battalion strength. Now, these ten battalions of infantry, they had plenty of officers, and those officers all got together to celebrate the Emperor's birthday on the 10th of August. Now, this was actually five days before his birthday fell. His birthday 
was the 15th of August. But they had the birthday party five days early because obviously on the day, the enemy might launch an attack. A, just to because it's something you do to annoy someone is rain on his birthday party. But also, you might possibly expect the French to all be drunk. So it's a good chance to launch an attack. This really must have been something to see. Byrne describes it thus, quote, 10,000 soldiers and 400 officers dined at the same table, and each man, having his glass filled, drank to the health of the emperor, etc., the general giving the signal. In the evening, the camp was illuminated, and many curious and allegorical figures of victory, etc., with the emperor's effigy, were exhibited in transparent paintings, end quote. Now, this would be something of a last supper for the French army. It would be, certainly be something of a last supper for many of our Irish regiment colleagues, because I have to say we're getting into August 1813, and it would be a bloody one indeed. The armistice couldn't last forever, however, and given that Austria and Sweden have now taken this opportunity to join the Sixth Coalition, it was probably best for France that it didn't. Byrne recalls a conversation that he had with General Puthau about the upcoming conflict. The general said, quote, No two men ever hated each other as did Marshal Davou and Marshal Bernadotte, the Prince of Sweden. The war will be desperate if they are pitched against one another. End quote. In the sector opposite the Irish, however, were Beluka's Prussians and Langerand's Russians. On the 17th of August, all restrictions were lifted and the struggle for the future of Europe resumed. Although, true to character, Blücher had already started moving his troops into the neutral zone since the 15th. Fighting began around Silesia, with the Irish moving from Goldberg to Lowenberg, pursued by, quote, light cavalry, which harassed them all day, end quote. This required the Irish voltigeurs to spend all day skirmishing to hold them at arm's length. The next day would not improve for them, with the regiment being ordered to execute a quick counter-attack to push back pursuing Rush Prussian infantry. Blücher, the wily old hussar, saw his chance, and soon a brigade of dragoons and a division of hussars were galloping at full speed towards the advancing and slightly isolated Irish. Luckily, they had spent the last two months training for just this type of situation, and possibly using a free reroll that we might uh, give them at the end of the video, both battalions successfully formed square, holding out against the approaching cavalry. The General de Division, General Loriston, took shelter in the square of the 1st Battalion. Now, Blücher, he'd obviously been watching my How to Use Light Cavalry video, because having formed the infantry into square, having forced them into square, he brought his artillery forward, and soon canister and ball were reaping a bloody toll. The Irish had found themselves in a very difficult situation, and this would go on to be the bloodiest in their regiment's history. Now, before we actually get into the Battle of Goldberg, I'm going to have a quick aside and talk about the purpose of firing artillery at squares. Now, rather counterintuitively, you might think, well, it's a nice dense target of pack guys, so you can just kill them all. Now, very rarely did you use, or even now, do you use artillery just to kill everyone. It's not precise enough for that kind of thing. And it would take far too much time and far too much resources. So what they're actually trying to do is you're trying to break a gap into the, the quote, wall of the enemy square. So imagine a square is like a castle wall. You're trying to knock a breach in that wall. Once there's a gap, cavalry gets inside. Now, cavalry absolutely will kill everyone in a square if they can get inside it. So the artillery isn't just there to kill everyone. It's there to, to open gaps that horses can go through. Now, that it could either be physically that they just blast the holes and the people who are either side of that, that file just get taken out, so there's a hole made there. Or it could be that people start to waver under the fire two or three steps back and suddenly there's a gap that the cavalry can break through. Now, the KGL had the King's German Legion Dragoons. They had major success breaking not one but two squares at Garcia Hernandez. It all starts because they the French were in square they were being charged, they shot a horse, and the horse dying crashed into the square. So you imagine sort of a horse going down on its side and then sliding into a square. Took out maybe three or four files of men, so rows of men stood next to each other. That created a gap that allowed the KGL to get in and gut the, uh, the, the square from the inside out. The survivors, 
seeing that you know, th they had no chance now the square was broken, ran to the second square, forcing their way in. They were pushing men out of the way, which then created a gap, which the KGL went in and did the same thing to the second square as well. The most important thing when you're in a square is that the gaps are closed as quickly as possible. You can't stop the gaps from happening, but it's about closing them as quickly as possible. And it becomes an officer's, and particularly an NCO and a senior NCO's job, to make sure that those gaps are closed quicker than that Hazar or Dragoon can gallop into them. So anyway, back to the battle. So that's what we're looking at. The uh, you Imagine the scene. You've got the two squares of the Irish. The cavalry are not milling around them. They're just off to the side. They're out of musket range. They're waiting for their opportunity to strike. Every 40 seconds or so, a cannon goes off, and it reaps a bloody harvest, like a scythe going through the unit. It'll take out maybe four maybe eight men, maybe it'll miss entirely. But every 40 seconds, 60 seconds, one of these cannons going off. And all you can hear is the blast of the cannons and the shouting of the officers and the NCOs, close ranks, things like that, just to, to keep the square cohesive, to keep it together. Basically what I'm saying, that in this situation, at all levels, the leadership is the most important thing. And we know that the Irish have got the most number of officers per men, so they're actually quite quite well set up to be able to handle this kind of thing. One of these men who you would want in this situation is Colonel Tennant, the Presbyterian commander of the 1st Battalion. Mounted in the centre of his battalion square, he was constantly ordering the men to close ranks, fill that gap, his harsh Northern Irish accent carrying over the sounds of battle. Until it didn't. And so it was that on the 18th of August, 1813, Schefter Battalion Tenant, the Low Church Protestant loyal to the English crown, until he witnessed a British dragoon galloping down the street, dragging an Irish woman by her hair, was cut in half by a cannonball. Byrne recalls, quote, The cannonball, striking a belt in which he carried his money, served as a knife to separate the body, and when burying him, they found several pieces of gold that fell out of his entrails, and part of his gold watch, end quote. As bad as the morale loss of the battalion commander is, Tennant's horse, spooked by the sudden loss of weight, galloped for one of the gaps in the line, sowing further confusion. Luckily for the Irish, none of these waiting Allied cavalry were close enough to take advantage. He was far from the only casualty. Colonel Lawless had his horse killed under him, as did General Vachero. He was sheltering with the Irish battalion and was heading for the walled farm. There was a critical moment of danger as the square dissolved into individuals attempting to climb the stone wall which would protect them from the enemy cavalry who, knowing that this time would come, were circling like waiting vultures. When the square touched the wall, it dissolved and, spearing their horses, the cavalry pounced, lancers and sabres laying open the backs of those unfortunate to be stationed at the back of the square. Captain St. Ledger, so recently inducted into the Légion d'Honneur and handpicked from the Irish Regiment to assist General Vachero, picked up the general bodily and, with the assistance of an officer still with the regiment, Lieutenant Elliot, threw him over the wall, scrambling up after the general himself. Turning back to reach his hand down to aid the lieutenant, however, Captain St. Ledger could only watch horrified as, surrounded by a knot of enemy cavalry, the young man was sabred. Eventually, however, this nightmare came to an end. The Irish units had reached cover, the woods and the walls respectively, stopping the cavalry pursuit. Any Prussian infantry follow-ups were dissuaded by the arrival of the 2nd Brigade of the 17th Division under General de Brigade Sibley. The regiment had survived and stood firm before the enemy cavalry and artillery, but it had been seriously damaged. Of roughly 500 men spread across both battalions, 300 of them had been killed or wounded. One such unfortunate was Sergeant Costello, the man who had settled his private score with that Cossack, much to Marshal Ney's amusement. He had lost an arm. In addition to Colonel Tennant, the officer's mess saw three other members killed, Captain Evans and Lieutenants Osmond and Macaulay. Colonel Ware, commander of the 2nd Battalion, had been wounded three times. His horse, his horse was also wounded, as was that belonging to Colonel Lawless, the commander of the regiment. Two more captains had been wounded, Captains Parrott and Eckhart, and five lieutenants, O'Brien, Brown, Wall, Petters and Elliot, who had survived his sabring after throwing General Vachero over the farm wall. 
This is important because some of these men, despite only being lieutenants, had been with the regiment since it was formed as the Irish Legion back in 1804. Their wounding was a huge blow to the experience and the spiritual heart of the regiment. Even the few that did escape direct injury, quote, had their uniforms bespattered with the blood and brains of the men killed beside them, end quote. And it is with no surprise the regiment staggered back, punch drunk, to the location it had spent the previous night. The next few days would allow the regiment a little more time to mourn and bury their colonel in a grave dug by the bayonets of his men, as the Allied probes were fended off by a Napoleon Bonaparte never more energetic. The Allies had put forward the Trachenberg Plan, which was that armies would fall back in the face of the French troops commanded by Bonaparte himself and attack at other areas of the line where his sub-commanders were in charge. This meant that the Emperor himself was dashing from pillar to post and coming across all sorts of units in his journey. In fact, on August the 21st, Colonel Lawless was informed to hold his regiment ready for review by the Emperor, who was expected that day, coming to assist Marshal MacDonald's 8th Corps. He arrived at the Irish Regiment's location, Lowenberg, at about 1pm, but he had little time to conduct official reviews, ordering the Irish into an attack almost as soon as his horse stopped. Below the regiment was a river which had been bridged until the day before when they had been destroyed. Now, I couldn't find out who destroyed the bridges or how they were destroyed. I don't think they were stone ones. They were probably just wooden ones that had been taken down by either side just to uh, to slow an enemy attack. I, I would imagine it was done by the French, but who knows. This meant that a mill a little further along the river would be the best crossing place. Unfortunately, though, being an obvious target, it was covered by enemy artillery. The regiment formed up Captain Byrne and his grenadiers at the front and made their way past the Emperor, Colonel Lawless, issuing the order to salute their Emperor and the man next to him, the King of Naples, Marshal Murat. Having moved down the slope towards the mill, Colonel Lawless made his way to the front of the regiment. He would lead them across the river, and due to his horse still being wounded, he would do so on foot. Almost as soon as the colonel stepped into the water, the enemy artillery opened up and a cannonball struck him in the leg, pitching him into the water. Six of Burns' grenadiers leapt to grab the colonel and, dragging him out of the water and placing him on a door, probably taken from the mill, they rushed him back to the Imperial headquarters. Napoleon, seeing the Irishman's condition, instructed his chief surgeon, Baron Larry, to perform the amputation. This was successfully completed. And so, rather ironically, the former head surgeon at Dublin Medical College would now live with one leg. While he would survive the war and end as a Marischal de Camp, which he said equates to a British Major General in a letter to Lord Concurry on the 11th of August 1815, for him, the war was over. After the action, both the Emperor and Marshal Murat sent their ADCs to inquire about the Colonel's health. Such was the regard he was held in. With Lawless out of the fight, the commander of the 2nd Battalion, Colonel Ware, took command of the regiment. With our constant companion in this story, Captain Byrne and saint Leger, now taking over as 1st and 2nd Battalion commanders respectively. Having crossed the river and at the head of Puthos Division, the Irish regiment advanced. Remember, the Allied strategy at this point was to fall back in the face of Napoleon's attacks, and that's exactly what they did, although there was still skirmish fighting for the rest of the day. The loss of Colonel Lawless would be an even more grievous blow to the regiment than that of Colonel Tennant. Lawless had been the man to save the very heart, the very spirit of the regiment. When, grievously wounded, he had smuggled the 1st Battalion's eagle out of the capture of Flushing. He had been nearly arrested for pr protesting the scandals and the corruption of Guillaume Clark, the Minister of War. And he had successfully integrated a unit that had over 30 nationalities represented in his ranks. He was, in short, completely irreplaceable. Puto, who I suspect had a soft spot for the Irish, sought out Colonel Ware after the fighting, which by this point had pushed the enemy back four kilometres and gave the and confirmed the appointments of the three senior commanders. The next day, the 23rd of August, dawned and... The attack was to continue. This time, Baluka's army was opposite the Irish. Their left wing resting on a town called Goldberg. Now, that may sound familiar because I've mentioned it twice already. The, the, the most recent time I mentioned it 
was because it was one of the battles that the son of Wolf Tone fought in. More importantly, the first time I mentioned it, it's because it was the Irish garrison during the, well, just before the armistice. So, once again, we have the Irish have been positioned somewhere, they're ordered out of it, and then a few months later, or you know, days later in the first case, they have to go back in and capture it again. I say it was Blucher's army, I specifically say Blucher's army, not the Prussian army, because, in this instance, the troops garrisoning the hill upon which Goldberg sits and Goldberg itself were in fact Russians. Now, if I had to defend a hilltop with units from any continental parallel in the Napoleonic Wars, I think the Russians would probably be my first choice. So things were not looking great for the Irish. Early in the morning of the 23rd, they launched their first assault. The Russians firing at point-blank range and then a short rush driving the Irish away. A second assault was mounted later in the morning and once again, some Russian musketry broke that up and the Irish fell back. Then Colonel Ware decided that enough was enough. He got all the reserves up, he got the entire regiment together and he launched his final assault. The Russians began firing and still the Irish came on. With a cheer, they started to run for the last 50 yards. The Russians, stalwart and brave as they are, realise that they're half a kopeck a month and this German village probably weren't worth dying for to some crazed Irishmen, so they fell back. But they fell back in good order. Seeing the flank fall, the entirety of Blucher's troops had to fall back to maintain their line. It was the third major test for the Irish in a week. The first one was when their squares had been flensed by the Allied artillery. The second was leading the attack over the mill stream, and this was the third. It was as bloody as the others. Another officer, Captain Jackson, had been lost in the first assault. His wallet, containing his brevet papers, were found next to a pile of Irish dead, most of them stripped for valuables and horribly disfigured by the manner of their death. Thus it was that this officer was listed killed in action. It would be some surprise when a year later he would turn up alive and well, having spent the last year in a Russian prisoner of war camp. Presumably he'd been searched by someone looking for valuables. Being a Russian, he, and this is no insult, being a Russian, he probably couldn't read, so the papers were just discarded with the rest and he was sent with the prisoners to the rear. Less fortunate, however, were Colonel Ware's horse killed from under him and the man who had been flung over the wall by Captain St. Leger, General Vachereau, had been killed at the head of the Irish regiment. The rest of the division had also taken a beating. Colonel Ober, with the 134th, had been promoted to General de Brigade on the field. Not that they did him much good. He was dead by lunchtime. Still, the day belonged to General Putho and the Irish. That evening, as well as further confirming the appointment of the colonel and the two captains into their positions. He also recommended the regiment for 11 Legion d'Arnais and a cross of the officer of the Legion for Captain Joseph Parrott, who was already a Chevalier of the Legion. These had all been signed off by General de Division Lauriston, the corps commander. Despite these limited successes, particularly under the eyes of the Emperor, the tide of the war was turning and the French were being inexorably pushed out of Germany and so a general retreat had begun. Marshal MacDonald, not a massive fan of pulling back, had decided that a quick counter-attack was necessary to stop the Allies from pursuing too closely. And seeing that Blücher had quite a strong position, began to pull all forces in the area available to him. On the 25th, he launched his counter-offensive. General Putho's role would be to sweep around the flank of the enemy and cut off their route of escape. Again, the Irish would form the anvil upon which the French hammer could fall. Unfortunately, a torrential downpour that night would turn the roads to mud and mean that while it was difficult for the troops to move, it was almost impossible for the artillery to. Additionally, it closed down communication between Putho and either his own corps commander or Marshal MacDonald. The sudden deluge also swelled local rivers and caused huge amounts of damage which will become more relevant later. In this situation, General Putho had a decision to make. Did he continue his mission and attempt the sweep, not knowing whether Marshal Marmont would ever even be launching his attack, or would he abandon it and return to the army against orders? The division spent the night in the pouring rain, hoping they would gain some clarity, 
and that they definitely did. Two massive explosions lit up the night. These weren't the explosions of a battery of cannons or a battalion of infantry. These were the explosions of a French corps blowing up its ammunition supplies in order to escape across a swollen river. Putho knew that the counter-attack wasn't going to happen, and so he would have to concentrate on getting his men west and across the river Boba. Moving off at first light, they got to a bend in the river, which now had become something of a raging torrent. On the far bank were a detachment of Westphalian engineers who really had to wait for the river to calm before they could begin construction of a bridge. This meant the regiment could do little but sit and wait and hope that the Allies didn't come on them too quickly. As the morning wore on, like a seeping damp, the Allies moved to the east bank of the river Boba. The French had been trying to evacuate troops all night, but the Irish in their rather exposed position had got there a little too late. Soon they saw Russian and Prussian scouts, and then eventually more and more of the enemy got into view as intelligence got back that a division of French were cut off on their side of the river. As full morning broke, 40,000 allies were set to crush the 6,000 of General Putho's command. It was over for him, and it was over for them, but they were going to make the allies bleed. To this end, the division formed a line of battle. The Irish elite companies commanded by Captain Burke occupying a village on the left flank of the line. This was, without question, the division's last hour. Seeing the French trapped in the U of the river bend, the Allies spread across the whole mouth of the bend, sensing an easy victory. Wanting it over quickly, Russian General Georgi Emanuel, a Serbian, now fighting for the Tsar, launched his Russian cavalry into an assault, supported by two squadrons of Prussian Lieb Hussars under Major von Schrenk. These cavalry were repulsed, the bend in the river not allowing the cavalry to get round the flanks and carve up the infantry. This would have to be done the old-fashioned way, the general thought. A number of infantry assaults were then launched, some on the village, some across the line, Prussian Landwehr and Russian Opolcheni being driven off by the now battled, hardened French and Irish troops. Six hours into the battle raging, the Russian commander was getting frustrated. This should have been over in 20 minutes. And so, he finally committed the best troops he had under his command, five battalions of Russian Jaeger. These men rushed forward and were met with a ferocious barrage of musketry and fire from the 12 cannons the division had remaining. For another 90 minutes, the fighting continued all along the line, but the sound of firing was getting less and less as the French and the Irish began to run out of ammunition. Eventually, the Russians were able to break into the town, and soon vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting began. Knowing that the ammunition had been expended, General Putho then ordered the regiment to withdraw and swim the swollen river Boba. This was a desperate act indeed. The unit plunged into the water, some men being carried off by the current. Others were shot as they were swimming by the Russian marksmen. Still yet others, not in a position to even enter the water, just surrendered. At a roll call that evening, the Irish regiment had gone from having roughly 500 men at the start of the resumation of hostilities to now consisting of 37 officers and men. 20 Irish officers had been killed, three had been captured, along with almost all the enlisted men. The survivors included Captain Byrne, Captain St. Ledger, and Lieutenant Lynch, in addition to Colonel Ware, who had also rescued the regiment Eagle. Of the 6,000 men that General Putho had commanded at the start of the day, only 254 had escaped. The 17th Division was no longer a fighting unit. The Irish Regiment no longer existed. The survivors were ordered back to their depots at Boadaluc in Holland. The Irish Regiment's fighting for the cause of Napoleon was now over. While the units would eventually get back up to regimental strength, it would never again stand in the front line against Napoleon's enemies. The restoration of the Bourbon dynasty in 1814 disbanded all foreign units in the French army, with the exception of the Irish regiment, which, due to their long illustrious history of fighting for the kings of France, would now be renamed the Royal Irish Regiment, their distinctive green coats to be replaced with sky blue ones. When making his mad final roll of the dice during the Hundred Days, Napoleon returned to France, the Irish 
once again swore allegiance to him. Colonel Ware producing the eagle, which rather than burning as per ordered by the Bourbons, he had hidden away for just such an occurrence. The regiments also petitioned the returning emperor for a return to their green coats, but this wasn't seen as enough of a priority for the newly reorganised army of a hundred days. And while they did their best to raise the men and troops required to form their regiment back up to full strength, unfortunately by the time Napoleon lay broken on the field of Waterloo, the Irish had taken no part in the fighting. Louis XVIII was less forgiving to the Irish upon his second return, and on September the 28th, 1815, the king ordered the regiment disbanded, its eagle and its flags to be burnt in front of witnesses. The officers were dismissed, many went back to Ireland, the British a lot more forgiving mood these days, some went to America, but the men were enlisted into a new regiment who exist in the French army today, the Foreign Legion. And so we come to it. This is the end of our discussion of Napoleon's Irish Legion. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been an absolute beast of a series. I really, really enjoyed doing it. Now, one thing that I want to talk about before we uh, we finish this off is how, where does that leave us for using the Irish in our war games of black powder? Well, for me, I will just use them as a regular French battalion, but... We've mentioned a few times how over-officered they are, so I would probably give them Reliable or Elite 5+. plus. I think I would probably go with one of those rules. I certainly would not go with both, and I think Elite 5+, plus might be a little bit strong. We talked about how much focus the French put on training to form square, so I think that a French army of 1813 should be able to re-roll any failed square test. Now, that's using the supplement rule so that's a strategy rating test so normally you'd only pass them maybe uh 60 of the time because you're looking at maybe a seven or an eight or less so you know they'll just give you a little bit more flexibility than that if you're doing the double two uh, sorry the double one or double six that's presented in the main rule book i wouldn't give them a re-roll for that they're so unlikely to fail it anyway that it would feel a little bit harsh to your opponent if you got to you know you rolled a double one a 1 in 36 chance of doing it, and then you got to re-roll. I'm, I'm not sure that would be very fair. But they make an absolutely fantastic unit on the tabletop. If you are a French player or collector, and you're sick of painting dark blue coats, then the Irish really are a great opportunity to paint something different. I started painting a regiment of them from front rank, but I now want to go back, and I want to have officers in with the battalion, with the company, sorry. So I want to have a Captain Byrne leading the Grenadiers. I want to have a Colonel Ware and a Colonel Tennant and all that stuff. So I want to do them justice. So I'm going to go back to do them. I'm probably going to end up doing them in Perry's plastic, I think. But that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed the episode and the series. I wanted to get it out on this weekend because it was St. Patrick's Day last Friday. But thank you very much for watching, and I shall see you guys in the next one.